You're listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with global soul. Welcome to Contemporary Classics, a show featuring concert music exclusively by 20th and 21st century composers. I'm your host, Dave Lake. Some of this music will be by composers whose names may be unfamiliar to you, and some of the music will be by much more recognizable names in contemporary composition. Some of the music may shock you, but I think many of you will be surprised to find out how much music by contemporary composers is immensely enjoyable. The whole purpose of this show is to demonstrate the wide variety of contemporary classical music that is available and to bring my joy of contemporary classical music listening to you. As always, our opening theme music is from the work Nocturne by Kirsten Volnes. Tonight on Contemporary Classics Composer Conversations, we have William Price. William Price is a Associate Professor of Music and Coordinator of Music Theory and Composition at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. He is known for his prodigious production of instrumental works, particularly involving wind instruments, but more and more he's becoming involved in electroacoustic works. Welcome, William Price. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate it. First off, let's uh, find out a little bit about how you became a musician and how you became a composer. When I was about 11 years old, I went with my sister and my parents to a band boosters meeting in Jimison, Alabama. I was a Little League baseball player, and I was sitting in the corner, and I saw my parents talking to the local band director, and I knew something was up, and they came over, and they asked if I wanted to play cymbals in the marching band. I said, sure, what's a cymbal? And so then for that entire year, I was a walking cymbal holder. Then I started playing other percussion instruments through high school. Then I went on to college and started performing with jazz bands and rock bands, classical music. Uh, different orchestras and wind ensembles. And then while I was working on my undergraduate music education at the University of North Alabama, I just started composing. One of my favorite composers was and still is Frank Zappa, and I looked at his works and I thought, maybe I'd like to try this. I'd been songwriting before, writing songs and composing a little bit, but I thought I'd start taking a little bit more seriously. And then from there, I started writing different works besides percussion works, small chamber works, And then uh, I decided to apply for graduate school, and I applied to uh, Louisiana State University. And fortunately for me, I was accepted into the program, and I studied with uh, Dinos Constantinides, acoustic music, and I studied electroacoustic music with Stephen David Beck. And I was fortunate to be able to stay with those two men. They're wonderful composers and pedagogues. Then I started looking for other opportunities for my works uh, outside the university system, and I started joining different organizations and started trying to find publishers and avenues to distribute works, publishers and recording companies and different festivals and conferences, and it seems to be doing okay. I've I've been very fortunate and lucky to be a composer and get to do what I love for all these years. Now, you came out of the percussion side. How did you become so knowledgeable about particularly the winds? Because your writing for the winds is absolutely marvelous. Well, thank you very much. As a percussionist, even in high school, most of the time, most percussionists end up writing marching cadences or little featurettes during the marching band solos. And so most percussionists tend to compose anyway at some form or fashion for, for the battery or the ensemble. And I started writing more for winds because my office mate while in college at LSU was a saxophonist. 
And the saxophonists are avid new music fans, and I started writing a lot for them, and I started branching out in other instruments as well. Speaking about saxophone, one of the works that I absolutely love is Hook, Line, and Sinker. Thank you. And that is for soprano, alto, and baritone saxophone. Yes. As well as clarinet, bass clarinet, and piano. Yes. And we're going to be actually listening to a recording of it. And this recording is a Butley alto saxophone. Well, I guess all the saxophones. Except for tenor. Except for tenor. <laughs> uh, he's playing soprano saxophone, alto saxophone, and barry saxophone. And then K. Hosada Air. Yes. Piano and Christopher Rayer on clarinet. And this is actually from an album called Characters, and it's on Mark Records. Yes. Brian recorded it a few years ago. He's got some wonderful works on there as well by Stephen Lias from Stephen F. Austin University in Texas, and another one that's just a wonderful work by Perry Goldstein, who teaches at SUNY Stony Brook, a sonata for saxophone and piano. Both beautiful works. This work... I absolutely love the beginning. Thank you. It, it starts with a clarinet with a very soft passage, and then you hear a da-da with everybody, and then the clarinet does a soft passage again, then you hear da-da, da-da, da-dee, and then you hear the soft passage, and then it goes into pretty much the the sense of the first movement, which is very highly rhythmic, you hear the piano sort of keeping this very rhythmic figure at the bass, all sort of alternating right and left hand, and allowing the saxophone and clarinet to sort of shift back and forth with themes as they go through in a very lively fashion. Thank you. I, I don't know what the marking is, but probably it's something allegro in that first section. And then it begins quietly with, it must be like adagio, maybe lento, uh, yes. very slow, uh, with a quiet building sax and clarinet, and then there is sort of an interaction between the piano in the background, a lot of ornamentation in this section, beautiful evocation of what the clarinet and the saxophone can do. And then you get back into a quick pattern, and then return to the slower pattern toward the end. This piece really gives both that which most people consider virtuosic. I have yes. to say, I don't. But most people consider virtuosic fast. Um, oh, yeah. And the rhythmic features and the some, somewhat changing rhythms. But you also allow for these beautiful lyrical passages, which to me is virtuosic too, to allow for that full expression of what those instruments can do. Thank you. The overall, the idea was, at the time I was writing it, I was exploring three different styles. One was the Shostakovich, the early period, some of his early works, as well as his wonderful use of counterpoint. I was also looking at his second trio, Opus 67, with it for violin, cello, and piano. Beautifully written work. And then I was also listening to Eric Dolphy's Out to Lunch, the jazz album, post-bop. Very rhythmic-oriented, of course, those jazz, syncopated jazz rhythms, as well as that highly dissonant sound he uses in that album. And then I was also listening to a lot of Iggy Pop and the Stooges punk music uh, at the time. So I think this piece kind of tends to show those influences through the work. Maybe not with strings, maybe not with jazz, quintet, or sextet, or even guitar or anything like that, but kind of a blend of more of the attitude, and I hope for the counterpoint and the rhythmic drive more than anything else. Well, that explains it. Now I know. Why I love it so much. I love Shostakovich, particularly the richness oh, yeah. and, and the harmonies. I love Eric Dolphy. I mean, his live from Illinois concert is just something I listen to again and again and again. Yeah, I and, do the same thing without the lunch. I always come back to that album. And then Iggy Pop and the Stooges. Yeah. I mean, that was the beginning of punk. Yeah, I love it punk. sure was. I do, too. Especially, was it Raw Power and Search and Destroy? It's a great album. Tonight on Contemporary Classics Composer Conversations, we have William Price. How do those works sort of work into this piece? I think it's more about the overall presentation of the gestures. It's more gestural than anything else. Like you said, the opening idea where you hear the soft clarinet and then get that tutti fortissimo or interjection. So I like to think of the way I tended to approach this piece was I wanted something that's going to grab you at the beginning some kind of gesture, and that's where that descending line that you said, that beat up, 
And then through the course of the work, I start to extend that interjection, more of an interruption between the different ideas, more of the melodic ideas, going back and forth. And then taking that same idea and extending it even further into what more of a musical digression. So taking the small kernel uh, as it develops over time, over the longer narrative of the other piece behind it, so to speak. So you have, essentially, it's all gestural. You've got also, besides that first idea, the beat up, that descending idea, I've also got those thick percussive chords. So that's the percussion, where you don't really hear the piano, per se. You just hear more of the, the strike itself without any harmonic content. It's percussive. And then the longer narrative, those longer melodic lines that you were mentioning within the, the clarinet and the saxophone, more of a French line. So the overall arch and the narrative tends to, I guess you could say, is a nice counterpoint to what the piano is doing in the comping that you hear in the background of the, the piano. That's more of that jazz comping that we hear where they stay the ostinato and keep everything together. But the harmonies, a lot of them are clusters and just dissonances that you would hear in maybe even Shostakovich or even if you had a distorted guitar. In a few places, I ask the musician to, when they hold a note, to ask them to distort it progressively. So they keep the ordinario or an ordinary tone, the one they've worked on all their lives to perfect, and then suddenly they have to distort it at the end of the crescendo. So you get some kind of more like what you'd hear in a jazz setting or maybe in a rock setting. But I think the juxtaposition of the dissimilar ideas also helps thinking almost like a jump cut in real time or a jump cut visual style. I think also has a tendency to be portrayed of those different styles, especially punk rock and jazz, because in the studio you can edit, and you have those quick jumps in the editing room. Trying to portray that in classical music live is difficult to do, but I hope that comes across in this piece. Yes, it does, in the form of that shift from that very highly interactive at the very beginning and highly rhythmic at the very beginning, and then you have that sort of slow, adagio, quiet sort of building in the center, then you get back to the quick. Those are almost like movements. I mean, this is one continuous piece, but those are yeah. almost like movements. Well, the, the slower section is based on my love for Renaissance modality. Renaissance music, maybe a Palestrina or a Victoria. So that's my homage, I guess you could say, because I need contrast after that. And the contrast is from being something fast and rhythmic and chaotic to something slow and a change of mood, so to speak. And I think that kind of counterpoint helps a little bit. So it's in the texture, slow it down, and then I have the ability to speed back up and go back into that faster section. So it provides a rhythmic contrast as well as a, a contrast in tempo and mood. And so let's listen to Hook, Line, and Sinker. Again, this is from the album Characters on Mark Records. Hook, Line, and Sinker. This is from the album Characters on Mark Records. You're listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with global soul. WRUU brings you the most diverse and passionate local radio programming on the air in Savannah. This all-volunteer and non-profit community radio station accepts no money from any form of government. Our diversity and independence is made possible only through the generous financial support of listeners like you. We rely on your annual and ongoing monthly contributions to cover the many costs associated with bringing you our broadcast and web programming. If you are a contributor, Thank you. If you're not yet a contributor, please show your appreciation of the role WRUU plays in your life by becoming a contributor in any amount. You can donate quickly and easily by credit card or check. Just find the donate and subscribe links at WRUU.org. Thanks for listening to and supporting WRUU. This portion of WRUULP Savannah Soundings programming is made possible by support from the 2018 Savannah Music Festival, which runs from March 29 through April 14, 2018, presenting classical artists, the Zuckerman Trio, Atlanta Symphony Orchestra with Robert McDuffie, Steely Antico, Daniel Hope and Friends Chamber Music Series, and more. Information at savannahmusicfestival.org. 
Hi, I'm Ian McCarthy, host of In the Pocket, Sunday evenings from 8 to 10 p.m. here on WRUU. I want to invite you to our second annual Tunes and Brews fundraiser at Southbound Brewing Company, April 28th from 6 to 10 p.m. Join us for our biggest party of the year in support of Savannah's only community radio station, 107.5 FM. This year, we're excited to announce that a few familiar WRUU voices will be providing live music. Josephine Johnson of Sister Sound and Clay Hodges from Monday Motivation will share their tunes. Even yours truly will perform with the local band Nancy Druid. We'll also feature acts like Dead Neighbors of Athens, Georgia, Teen Divorce of Jacksonville, Florida, and DJ C. Powers from Savannah joining in on the action. We'll bring the tunes, Southbound will bring the brews. So join us Saturday, April 28th from 6 to 10 p.m. at Southbound Brewing on East Lathrop Avenue. More information can be found at wruu.org. See you there, and thanks for helping keep community radio alive and well in Savannah. Tonight on Contemporary Classics, Composer Conversations, we have William Price. How do you get your work in front of someone like Brian Utley so that he would put it on one of his recordings? Actually, the, this piece started out, I saw a call for scores by the Telema Trio in Belgium. They're based out of Ghent, and they were looking for pieces for clarinet, saxophone, and piano. I thought I was, you know, working one day, and I saw that call for scores, and I thought, huh, I'd like to try that. I like saxophone, I like clarinet, I like piano. It's a nice trio ensemble, so I'll take a look at it. And I finished the work, and I sent it to them. But then I sent it to Brian, who I knew from uh, my days at LSU, Louisiana State University, and I sent him a copy just for his thoughts and maybe to proofread it or something along those lines. And he emailed me back and said, I want to put this on my recital at Stephen F. Austin University. So I, I couldn't turn that down, so I said, sure. Chris and Kay and Brian worked on it, and they premiered it in Texas. And then they kept on playing it, and then they played it at the International Clarinet Association Conference in Atlanta, I think in maybe 2010 or earlier. I forget which date that was, but it was the ICA in Atlanta. And it was the first piece at an 8 o'clock in the morning concert. <laughs> and so that was that was interesting. This is a harsh piece to put on at 8 o'clock in the morning for a group of clarinetists, but they pulled it off, and they've performed it ever since, and they recorded it, and I'm very appreciative of that because it's a lot of work to be able to do something like that. I think it would be a good way to start the day. <laughs> I think so, too. But I think at conferences, I think people tend to stay out a little later uh, than they usually do, and so there were a few people that looked a little surprised when it started. But I think there was a very appreciative audience, especially in terms of uh, the trio's technical abilities. Because uh, Brian and Chris and Kay are wonderful musicians. I'm lucky to know them. Chris is currently professor of music at Stephen F. Austin, and Kay is currently the associate professor of piano at Baylor University. And Brian is the professor of saxophone at Vanderbilt University. So sometimes they get together and play, and then they all have their different concerts. And I've uh, written several works for Brian Utley. Most recently, a commission for a solo saxophone piece, a Sans Titre 7, uh, B, so to speak, and a few other works. He's uh, premiered a sonata for two saxophones last year and several other works of mine, and I'm, I'm lucky to know Brian. He's a wonderful musician and a constant muse, so to speak. The Sans Titre series, that's a series. It, yes, it is. Inspired by probably Dario's sequences, but not as avant-garde. I love the idea of kind of working on solo pieces and learning about the instrument so I can apply the things I learned, those studies, and I can apply those things to larger works or chamber ensembles or works for orchestra, wind ensemble, so I can experiment a little bit and get some feedback from musicians. I try to make them more of an absolute type of study as opposed to programmatic study so I can work on range and extended techniques and the characteristics of that instrument. My last one was for guitar, it's called Crucible, but it's a subtitle, Sans Titre 8, and it's for a guitarist here in town, Jeremy Grawl, and we're going to premiere that, I think, next year. It's a really long work, too. I need to learn how to write smaller works, but <laughs> he's been wonderfully helpful with the editing and talking about it and what works and what doesn't, because I'm not a guitarist. So I've learned that if I don't know something, I should ask somebody about it. Those of the Sans Titre series that I've heard, I've really, really liked. Well, thank you. So please continue. 
I'm going to do that. One will be for woodwinds, one will be brass, the next will be strings, and the none will be an, an instrument I'm unfamiliar with. I think the next one will be for organ. I've never written for organ, so I thought that'd be kind of fun to try and learn how to use all the stops. And I have to admit, but this is because I'm biased, I think I like the Sons Titre 5 oh. the best for amplified cello. I, I like that one, too. That's a fun piece. That was commissioned by cellist Craig Holkgren who's a new music enthusiast and cellist, and he's just a wonderful person to work with, and he's commissioned hundreds of works by contemporary composers. And he commissioned this one, and Laura U. Siskin is the cellist on the recording, and she did a great job. It was, it was a learning experience for me and her in the studio, trying to get the overall impression and the editing and the, the technological aspects of it on recording. Can you talk a little bit about those technological aspects? Sure. The idea is, really, it's, you know, a live performance work. So what I decided to do is add reverb to the live performance. There's a series of foot pedals that I asked for, reverb and delay and a few other things, distortion. Craig and I, the first time, played it on, I think, e-cello, which is an electronic cello, using the foot pedals. And it has a thinner sound because, I mean, in the hall. But we route the sound through surround sound speakers. The, the premiere was at UAB, and we have a surround sound system. So as you're sitting, you have the sound in front of you from the cello, but the actual sound itself surrounds you. So you're within a space within a space, so to speak. And then adding, like, delay pedals or a little bit more reverb here and there will give it the, a little edge to the sound. But over time, I've started to enjoy hearing it with a regular cello, with the full body, with a contact mic. So you still hear the full body and the timbre of the cello itself, the warmth of the cello sound, but you still get the surround sound. It's a little further in the background, but it still feels like you're within the space of the cellist. You're sitting closer, or it's more a forward sound in the hall, than as opposed to audience, performer. You're now with the cellist in the hall. And there's a recording of Sons Tetra 5 for Amplified Cello. Yes. And that is on the album Rush Hour. Yes. And Rush Hour is a Blaze Records. Yes, that's a, more of a, a retrospective of my electroacoustic music. I've been composing that type of music since 1997 uh, for the last 20 years. I started doing that, working with electroacoustic music and, and electronic music when I was at LSU, and I've continued doing that. And it's uh, something I enjoy doing as well as writing for acoustic instruments. And that album was released just the past year. Yes, the end of 2017 by Ablaze. Ablaze Records is a small company based in Cincinnati, and they did a really nice job with the production and the mastering. We recorded almost everything here at UAB, and then we had Ablaze send it out to have it mastered, and they did a wonderful job with that. And now the recording here, is it a regular cello or a electronic cello? It's a regular cello. We had two mics placed on it, one a close-up mic and one a distant mic in the room. So we had two different miking techniques involved so we could actually manipulate the sound during the editing process, bring it forward or bring it back if we needed to. Forward and back according to where the listener is. Uh, Laura U. Siskin is the cellist on the recording, and she did a great job. And so we'll listen to that now. Thank you. Sons Tetra 5 for Amplified Cello on the album Rush Hour. Tonight on Contemporary Classics Composer Conversations, we have William Price. Of course, I should have warned everybody before we played that, that you should have run and got your headphones, because the <laughs> best way to listen to this is with I headphones. I think so, too. I think so, too. Earbuds, I think it loses something. I, I listen to everything with over-ear headphones, so I can block everything out almost. When, especially when I edit. I've got near-field monitors at home, but I, sometimes I go back and forth between my headphones and my near-field because it tires my ears out, especially with electroacoustic music. Probably the same thing in your studio. If you have those monitors all the time, you get a little ear fatigue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think the richness of this, too, comes through with the headphones. I think you can pick up the subtleties maybe, too. Laura's a fantastic cellist. Again, like I said, I'm lucky to work with her. I think the two works that which you've paired them, uh, Hook, Line, and Sinker, as well as Sons Tetre 5 work well as a pairing in terms of the interjections and the interruptions and all these uh, types of things, uh, gestural music. I think it works well as a pairing. We have to talk about the move to electronic music. I guess it sounds like early in your doctoral work at LSU got interested in both electronic music and instrumental music. Does that come out of your interest in rock music? 
probably. I used to record in the studio when I was younger. I'd play in different bands, and we'd say we'd got our original uh, songs, and we'd go into the studio, and I'd watch the engineer and try to figure out what he's doing. This is back in the days of analog recording. I was always interested in going in the studio and listening to our documenting our work, so to speak. But when I went to LSU, I had to take a course in electroacoustic music. And I didn't have a Macintosh at the time. I barely had a computer that functioned. And they had a wonderful lab, and I started learning about this type of music, and I just fell in love with it. I thought, well, I can manipulate things in real time. I don't have to rely on the musician. I can use time, real time, as maybe a canvas for placement of objects and events in real time. And it was just fascinating to think, oh, I can move this over here, or I can move this over here. But we were using a programming language called C. The program is called C-Sound, but we're using a computer operation language where we'd have to code where things happen in time. So it wasn't a GUI or a user interface like Pro Tools or a lot of those kind of workstations. This was all computer language. And that was difficult at first, figuring out the logic and the flow of everything within that. Computer languages, it wasn't something I was familiar with, except for maybe when I was a, a teenager. But it was intense, but it was, it was an intensity that I really enjoyed working in the studio like that. And this album, Rush Hour, again on Blaze Records, is a really wonderful example of how you can use electronic music both in combination with instrumental music and then alone. Yes. I really enjoy it, but I think I have a tendency to use sources, media sources that are real, real-life sources. I would record myself playing a piano, I'd record it, and then I'd manipulate it. So they're not pure electronic sounds, but at least they're something I'm familiar with and other people would be familiar with. It's less abstract. The abstraction is the manipulation or the development of the sound as opposed to the sound itself. And then thinking about how I can develop that into a piece. You know, there are some composers or musicians who like to focus on the sound or the technique to manipulate the sound. It's one or the other. It, I think it takes a skilled composer to figure out how to take both ideas, the technology and the sound itself, to make an entire piece. That's the challenge. I would think it's a challenge, too, because it seems like some of these, if not all of them, can be presented in concert. Yes, that's what they're intended for. Early electroacoustic music was intended for the concert hall. And to make it viable, I think acoustically viable, or to provide some interest to the audience, you have to give them something, something to listen to, something interesting to listen to, something they can gravitate towards and grab onto, as opposed to something they've never heard before and they really can't relate to. Sometimes that happens. I mean, I don't want to pander to the audience. Fortunately for me, I like this type of music and using these types of sound sources, and so therefore, maybe they'll like it too. When a cellist walks on stage, yes, and then probably mics up after they get on stage, and then you hear Sans Tutre 5, yes. what is the reaction of the audience? Well, the initial reaction is probably to, through the gesture that they're performing at the beginning, as we just heard, that really distorted those double stops. I think it's more reaction to the content than the actual forward sound or the amplified sound. I've never had any negative reaction to the amplification. It's more about the, the material that they're listening to than the actual projection and sound projection itself. And how do they communicate that with you? Usually it's, uh, you know, most audiences don't come up to me and say, <laughs> I liked it or I didn't like it. Most of the time you can watch an audience from behind, so to speak. You can watch their head movements or the way they react, facial expressions. And sometimes they settle into it and sometimes they don't know how to react. But at least they're there and listening to new music, which is extremely important. And maybe they're hearing something new for the first time. Getting them outside their comfort zone is a good thing now and then. Why is getting people out of their comfort zone a good thing? Well, personally, I'm thinking about it with me. We become complacent in our experiences. And we expect the same thing every time. If I go to the movies and I see the same type of movie being created. After a while, I'm not experiencing anything new, and I know what to expect. And I'm not experiencing art, per se. To create art, I think you have to do something somewhat new. I mean, you're building on the past, of course. But if you don't try new things as a composer, or if you don't try to listen to new things as an audience member, I think we're losing out on a lot of new things, new experiences. 
and gaining some insight into different types of art, maybe other people's art and their experiences. It's important to know that. I have to admit, when I'm talking with people about classical music and they say, oh, did you see that, we'll say the Savannah Philharmonic, for lack of a better group, they're doing Beethoven's Fifth. I'm going to go and see that. I want to scream, how many times have you seen Beethoven's Fifth? What are you going to get new out of this performance? I agree in some instances. But I think it's fascinating. You and I both probably listen to the recording. A great recordings and great pieces will always come back to and try to find something new. Love the Fritz Reiner, was it 1950s recording? I think it is of Bartok's Concerto for Orchestra. That's a beautiful piece and it's a beautiful recording and I come back to it all the time and I find something new. But the same people that they would say, I'm going to go hear the Beethoven's Fifth again, I'm assuming they're listening for something new. If they're only going because it's Beethoven's Fifth, I don't know. Those same people, if, if you said, I'm going to go hear someone play my favorite pop song for the hundredth time in a row, they may turn their nose up at that, where they wouldn't turn it up if it's classical. A, a standard is a standard for a reason. But maybe those audience members are finding something new every time. I hope so. I guess I would be more optimistic <laughs> if every conductor and every instrumentalist was more like Glenn Gould. Oh, yeah. Who would reinterpret works on a regular basis and come up with interpretations that startle. I think so. In my classes I teach at UAB, we listen to a variety of recordings. And I really enjoy having my students listen to Glenn Gould play, I think, the French Suites. And when they listen to the Bach French Suites, you can hear Glenn Gould in the background hum along with himself. And sometimes it's with, in conjunction, and sometimes it's almost like a strange little counterpoint. And they're fascinated by that. And I said, sometimes the interpreter is doing different things while they're playing, and it's wonderful to hear that. It's something new they've never heard before. Or Glenn Gould's recording, I think, of, uh, I want to say, say three pieces, where it's actually a German video they created. I think it's a German video where it's a white room and he's dressed in black. This is a color video. And it's almost like a music video from the 1980s. It looks like one of those kind of things you'd see on TV from the early days of MTV. And they're like, who would watch this? I said, probably the rest of the world that doesn't really listen to pop music. Glenn Gould is a star, and that's what he focuses on recording. I have both sets of recordings of the Goldberg variations. Oh, yeah. And then I love to play that in combination with a recording of Murray Pariah doing it. Oh, wow. And so I love that to sort of interdigitate those and play each movement in all three versions. Oh, wow. And it is just eye-opening. And I have been prone to do that on my show, <laughs> Contemporary Classics, because of the fact that, oh, it was just a few weeks ago, I think, I did the the new Brooklyn Rider album has mm. a string quartet version of the glass saxophone quartet. Oh, that's a great piece. And so I played the glass saxophone quartet with saxophone quartet and then played it with the string quartet, each movement, back to back. Oh, wow. All the way through. And it's a different interpretation. Exactly. And it sounded very interesting. And I got some really good feedback from listeners about how they enjoyed hearing that. And so I'll probably continue to do things like that when recordings like that come up. I think that's fantastic. You're listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with Global Soul. Well, the same people that wouldn't want to hear a different interpretation, they wouldn't mind an actor getting a different interpretation of Shakespeare. They don't mind that, but if it's a performance, they like a certain performance of a musical piece. I always find it strange. I like to hear as many different interpretations if I can, because I may get something new. That performer may bring something out in the music I've never heard before or never thought about doing interpreting in a gesture or maybe some kind of counterpoint that I've really never heard before. They're listening to something completely different than I am. Just as a composer, basically if I compare it to film, I'm a screenwriter, and I give it to the, the actor, so to speak, and they interpret it, and they'll bring out different subtleties than I would, because I'm not the performer. And I, so maybe something I've never thought about before, and that's a wonderful surprise sometimes. I mean, the music is just a blueprint, essentially, for the performance. I think musicians understand that. It provides a blueprint with a certain amount of flexibility. Sure, yeah. I'm not so sure many listeners see it that way. I never thought about that. Because I guess I'm so worried about the, the piece itself 
and then the performance. I don't think about that last third part of it. I'm just hoping that I get the first performance, <laughs> uh, the first listening. Very rarely, as you know, in contemporary music, we, we don't get a lot of second or third or fourth performances sometimes. I mean, there's so many musicians and so many composers and so much competition, so to speak, and so limited opportunities. I will say this. I've had pieces performed by maybe two or three or four different groups, and if I did my job correctly, I'll hear the overall blueprint. I'll hear the overall idea. The plan still works. But within that, I'll hear some subtle variations, which will be nice. And if it's too outside of the idea of mine, maybe it's my fault. Maybe I didn't notate it correctly, and then I can fix it. Or maybe they decided to take a chance and try something different. It's just music, so I'll let them do whatever. I'd like to try different things sometimes. And maybe you would hear more of these repeated if they would stop playing music from dead white males from <laughs> several centuries ago. Compared in the last 20 years, you have so many more new music ensembles, contemporary music ensembles out there. You can just go to different composer websites, contemporary music websites, and there's always these calls by new ensembles, some established and some trying to become established. And they're always looking for new music and different combinations. So there's plenty of opportunities for performances if you have that particular instrumentation. As you pointed out, I write a lot for winds, but there's a lot of calls for strings. In some years, it'll be a lot of calls for winds and maybe none for strings. But to see more ensembles popping up and doing new music is a wonderful thing. Tonight on Contemporary Classics Composer Conversations, we have William Price. Well, let's talk a little bit about another piece of yours, and that is Rush Hour for Tenor okay. Saxophone and Fixed Media. Yes. What do you mean by fixed media? Uh, basically sound file. Uh, the electroacoustic works that were without instrument, for the intended for the hall, that's what I mean, just electroacoustic piece. A stereo sound file, we used to say digital sound file, and now it's called fixed media, it's just a synonym. I started writing that about 20 years ago for a tenor saxophonist, a friend of mine named John Perrine, who's currently the chair of the music program at Cleveland State University in Ohio. He's a fabulous musician, classically trained, but also an incredible jazz saxophonist. And so what we did is I wanted to write a piece for him, and he said, sure, let's try it. And I took him into the studio, and we recorded different things, just him playing. I'd ask him to do maybe key pops or play a passage that he would want to improvise or something I would give him. So we recorded all his sounds possible. And then I went in, using the computer, I created the sound file piece using him most of his sounds and things that he recommended or things he would improvise. The, the actual tenor sax part is he's accompanied by himself, so to speak. He's accompanied by the sound file, which incorporates his sounds and different things in that. And so we decided to go in 20 years later and finally record the piece. So this recording in the studio, I made a few changes because 20 years we changed a little bit. So compared to the original score, I made some changes in terms of timing and maybe a content here and there, and we decided to see what would happen. And so we came out with this recording with Ablaze Records. And it is in three movements, yes. Short Commute, Blind Spot, and Rush Hour, yes. which makes it sound programmatic. I, I think it is, yes. The overall programmatic idea of the practicing musician. John, when we first performed this, it was more of like a performance art piece. He would come out and look like he's coming home from work, and he would, we had a stage set up, so we'd have a couch on stage and maybe a coat rack, and he'd put all his gear down, and he'd hang up his coat, and then he'd pick up a saxophone and start practicing a little bit playing, and then I would start the sound file. He'd have the score in front of him, and then he would follow along with it. And so the idea is about the practice of musician and how reality becomes fantasy and vice versa. So he becomes transformed through the course of the piece, but then he's snapped back into reality near the end. Uh, at the beginning, we hear traffic sounds that are become distorted and developed, and it leads into the main piece. And then at the very end, at the climax of the piece in the third movement, you hear the traffic come in suddenly, and he's back to reality, so to speak. And have you played this live? Yes, we have, many, many times. He's performed it all over the country. Usually I'm with him when we do this, but he's performed it in Montreal at the World Saxophone Congress years ago. And that was a good performance. We, we got a really nice live recording out of that. And when you do it in 
performance. What are the complications that combine the live instrument along with the fixed media? Usually it's the, the speakers. That's probably the biggest challenge, making sure that the venue has the right size speakers for the volume. Some venues are older and they'll have the stereo speakers are closer together in the center of the hall so you don't get that separation. Or they may not have monitors, and so he needs to be able to hear himself. Or he can't see me when I give him the signal that the sound file is starting. So he gives me a nod, I have my hand up, and I signal to him that I'm starting the sound file. And sometimes it's hard to see depending on the location of the sound booth within that venue. So it's more logistics than anything else. John can play anything, so I'm not worried about his part. (laughs) Here's Rush Hour for tenor saxophone and fixed media. Rush Hour for tenor saxophone and fixed media. Tonight on Contemporary Classics Composer Conversations, we have William Price. Is there anything else we need to talk about in terms of this work? In the the score itself, some things are explicitly notated, and in some places there's a general idea, that impression that he's supposed to give, and in some places it's free improvisation. So it incorporates a lot of improvisation and indeterminacy involved. So it's a traditional score with a lot of, I guess you could say, chance elements involved, or improvisation. So does that come back to your jazz interest? I think so. I've been playing with jazz bands all my life, jazz ensembles, combos. and As a percussionist in a jazz group, that's main, mainly what I would do is keep time and improvise, fills, kicks, and those kind of things to keep the band together. And I would be deficient if I didn't jump then ahead to the pure electronics, although pure electronics is a misnomer because of the fact that you incorporate uh, often musical instruments, you incorporate other sounds into these electronic recordings. And so I think I'd like to do the three tropes. Oh, okay. Trope one, which is surface tension. Trope number two, which is saturation point. And trope number three, which is brush strokes, a gradient collapse. So what was the background behind these three? In electroacoustic music, people tend to do the same thing. They use the same techniques. They use the same gestures. And the trope itself is almost like a trope that you would see in any visual art or any art form. What do people all do the same? In other words, not an archetype per se, but the same thing. thing. In electroacoustic music, people tend to do these on a grand scale, these tropes. Uh, these long forms that grow out of something and then kind of fade away, almost kind of like an oval, so to speak. They use the same sound. So I thought I'd try to do those in miniature. Just to think about in a different size and different proportion, almost like studies, per se. And how do the three vary from one another? The gradient collapse is based on more granular synthesis, where I take these little bitty ideas, little pockets of sound, and take each little kernel, that's why it's called granular or grains, and uh, build those over time. The brush stroke is kind of, is almost like an improvisation of those sounds that I can uh, work on in real time. Surface tension is based on a drop of water, just taking a drop of water that was recorded and seeing what I can do with that as, as a sample itself. And then the next one, I decided to try something new in terms of just gesture itself and counterpoint of these layers of sound and color. Three tropes. Trope one, which is surface tension, Trope number two, which is saturation point, and trope number three, which is brush strokes, a gradient collapse. Three tropes. Trope one, which is surface tension, trope number two, which is saturation point, and trope number three, which is brush strokes, a gradient collapse. You're listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with Global Soul. WRUU brings you the most diverse and passionate local radio programming on the air in Savannah. This all-volunteer and non-profit community radio station accepts no money from any form of government. Our diversity and independence is made possible only through the generous financial support of listeners like you. We rely on your annual and ongoing monthly contributions to cover the many costs 
associated with bringing you our broadcast and web programming. If you are a contributor, thank you. If you're not yet a contributor, please show your appreciation of the role WRU plays in your life by becoming a contributor in any amount. You can donate quickly and easily by credit card or check. Just find the donate and subscribe links at WRUU.org. Thanks for listening to and supporting WRUU. This portion of WRUULP Savannah Soundings programming is made possible by support from the 2018 Savannah Music Festival, which runs from March 29 through April 14, 2018, presenting classical artist the Zuckerman Trio, Atlanta Symphony Orchestra with Robert McDuffie, Steely Antico, Daniel Hope and Friends Chamber Music Series, and more. Information at savannamusicfestival.org. Hi, I'm Ian McCarthy, host of In the Pocket, Sunday evenings from 8 to 10 p.m. here on WRUU. I want to invite you to our second annual Tunes and Brews fundraiser at Southbound Brewing Company, April 28th from 6 to 10 p.m. Join us for our biggest party of the year in support of Savannah's only community radio station, 107.5 FM. This year, we're excited to announce that a few familiar WRUU voices will be providing live music. Josephine Johnson of Sister Sound and Clay Hodges from Monday Motivation will share their tunes. Even yours truly will perform with the local band Nancy Druid. We'll also feature acts like Dead Neighbors of Athens, Georgia, Teen Divorce of Jacksonville, Florida, and DJ C. Powers from Savannah joining in on the action. We'll bring the tunes, Southbound will bring the brews. So join us Saturday, April 28th from 6 to 10 p.m. at Southbound Brewing on East Lathrop Avenue. More information can be found at WRUU.org. See you there, and thanks for helping keep community radio alive and well in Savannah. Tonight on Contemporary Classics Composer Conversations, we have William Price. It's really interesting to think in terms of electronic music that already tropes exist. Oh, yeah. I could use the word cliche uh, instead of trope, but I like this music so much that I tend to do these things, too. So I can forgive when I hear these things by students and professionals and everything else. And the trick is, can you do it in a new way? The tropes exist, but do you have a method to try different things? The mastery and the technique to do something different with something. Because, I mean, if you have an orchestra, people are going to try to do the same things with the orchestra. So is that a trope? Is that cliche? Or are you going to try to do something new? And it's really interesting because if you talk to most people, they say, oh, this electronic music, it's so brand new. And you actually <laughs> go really. back, and it's 30s and 40s. Some of the first electronic music that I'm familiar with, it probably goes back even earlier than that is actually from the 30s and 40s, and there was a big oh, sure. movement in electronic music in the 50s. I mean, and a lot of people today still think that the Rite of Spring is new. That's true. I mean, you know, 100 and something years ago, and anything new to them, per se. If it's, it's new to them, it's still new. It just means it existed before them, and then, but at least they encounter it. That's a good thing. And with your music that's a little bit more orally challenging, have any riots broken out? Oh, no, no, not yet. Maybe, maybe eventually. <laughs> I may have to come to the Birmingham New Music Festival and cause a riot. Uh, a riot of one. I don't know what that would be called. <laughs> we, we have really good audiences at the Birmingham New Music Festival, and most of the time they're educated. They know what to expect. They'll get some surprises here and there, but we have some wonderful composers in, in Birmingham. Uh, we've had our past members included Charles Norman Mason, Prix de Rome winner, Monroe Golden, who specializes in microtonal music, a wonderful composer. One of my favorite composers, Edwin Robertson, or Ed Robertson. Probably one of the best composers I know, fantastic composer, a master craftsman. We've also had as a member Dorothy Henman, wonderful composer. And LaDonna Smith, who specializes in free improvisation, one of the actual pioneers of free improvisation. Uh, so we've had a, quite a membership in the Birmingham Music Alliance, and I, it was my pleasure to know them. Uh, some of them are still members, and some have moved on, but I've learned a lot from them over the years. And it's great that the Birmingham Area Music Alliance has such a increasingly important festival, because when people think new music, you always think New York and 
the West Coast. Sure. But it's wonderful that Birmingham, Alabama, has such an event. Well, we're lucky that we have the support of the community as well as sometimes we get uh, funding from the state for the, the festival, and so we would be able to bring in some different musicians and guest composers. Uh, we're lucky that the Birmingham area supports us like they do. I directed the festival this past year, and as you can imagine, it was a lot of work to put something together like that, making sure the musicians had somewhere to play, the venues were set up, the composers submitted their pieces on time to the musicians and making sure all the venues were ready to go and making sure our support staff were well informed and making sure we had our programs. It was it was quite an endeavor, but it's it's worthwhile in the long run. Well, I want to congratulate you for not only being an active composer of new music, but also being instrumental in the support of the performance of new music. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I just like to hear my colleagues' work. Listening to music is a wonderful thing. We're, we're lucky we get to do that. Yeah, listening to live music is one of the most inspirational events that you can have. Oh, yeah, especially if it's the premiere. First time you get to hear him. It may be the next quartet for the end of time. It may be the next big piece, and you were there. And it may be an incredible event. It may not be, but if you don't go, you won't know. Well, I want to thank you so very much for giving me this time to talk with you. We've been talking with William Price. I listened to several of his works, and I want to th thank you so much for being a part of the Composers' Conversations here on Contemporary Classics. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate your time, and I hope your listeners enjoyed the, the show. <laughs>